Next up, Chloe. We're going from a first time speaker to, I mean, I don't want to say old hand, that sounds <laughs> not as polite, but obviously one of the very experienced speakers we have here today. And uh, an engineer of the year, award winner at UK wide industry event last year. So congratulations on that again, Chloe. Everyone, here's Chloe. Grab the clicker. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. So, hey everyone, I am Chloe McAree. I have been an AWS community builder for the past four years now, and I am a senior software engineer at Hamilton Robson. So, at Hamilton Robson, we specialize in software services and AV immersive experiences. So working with clients like X, Reddit, Salesforce, and Warner Brothers, it's really provided us with a unique mix of creative projects, but also scalable enterprise projects. But today I am here to talk to you about AWS Step Functions. But before I dive straight into the technical detail, I wanted to start with our customer, the problem we started facing, and ultimately why we ended up moving to use Step Functions. So we have been working with a client to create a construction recruitment platform called JobMatcha. So this allows workers to be able to sign up to match with jobs based on their skills, on their levels, their location to a job site and their salary expectation. In order for workers to sign up and get matched with a job, they need to give us a range of different identity documents um, to be able to prove their, their right to work within the UK. So whenever a worker on boards, uh, we asked for their passport, their CSCS card, which is like a construction trades card, and a P45 or P60 for proof of national insurance. Don't worry, these are dummy data. This is no PII on the screen. <laughs> but all of these checks were mandatory. And whenever we first started off, this was kind of our, our initial architecture. So a user would sign up either through the native application or the web portal, and once they uploaded their documents, we uploaded them to this SQS queue. And we then had this document validation service that would parse that, that queue and grab the pre-signed URLs to the documents that they had uploaded. You then see we have these individual lambdas that are responsible for the different document checks. So we had one fully responsible for passports, one for national insurance, and one for CSCS. And this document validation lambda would call out to them synchronously. They had a range of different machine learning checks and different rule sets to prove the validity of that one specific document. And then it would return the results to the document validation service. At this point, we would also run continuity checks because someone could give you a completely valid passport and a completely valid CSCS but they might be for two completely different people. So we want to parse those details and compare the results to make sure, one, that they're valid, but also that they're valid for the same person. Overall, quite simple, and it did work. But you know, with a live production project, <laughs> there's always changing requirements. And this onboarding service was like any other. There was always going to be changes. <coughs> the first thing to change was the CSCS service. It turns out that trainee workers didn't have their CSCS card before joining their first job, and so we made that optional. Totally fine, we added a nice little if statement into that document validation service, and we just said, hey, if that CSCS URL is there, let's go ahead, we'll run the checks, we'll get the response back. If it's not, let's ignore it. National insurance upload was the next to go. People could choose to manually enter in their uh, national insurance number instead of uploading a copy of a P45 or P60. And you probably know what's coming. Passport also became optional as not all workers would have a passport. So with passport being made optional, this gave us seven different permutations of documents that we might have to check and run continuity on. So you know, a worker might have all three of those documents, they might have any combination of just two of them, or they might just have one that needs to be checked. To cater for this, we started adding a lot more conditional logic into this document validation service. So when it was parsing that initial message, it had to say, does this specific document URL exist? If it does, let's carry out the check. However many documents responses we have, let's run continuity on them. Um, so again, we added that in and it was working, 
But a few months ago, more changes came in and we now had to optionally support visas and driver licenses. This now opens up, which I think is 26 different permutations of different possible document checks and different possible continuities that we might have to run. So I know what you're all thinking. Let's add a few more conditionals in there and we'll be done with it and it will just work. But you know, if we were to continue on with this previous architecture, this document validation service, it just starts to become a bottleneck. Already, it was complex. It was that place if you picked up a Trello ticket, you're like, I do not want to be touching the code in there. And even the, the synchronous nature of this, so this document validation service was reaching out, it would check visa, it would wait and come back, then check passport. With the more documents that we're adding over time, the time to run this document validation service was just going to grow exponentially. So we really had to look at this solution, and it made me think of a quote that I heard back at reInvent. And that quote was that lambdas should be used to transform and not just transport. And I feel like we've all been guilty of that. It's just, let's just spin up a nice little lambda service and it will move data from one place to the other, or it will just be solely responsible for triggering downstream logic. And that's what this document validation service was starting to feel like. It was just sitting there in the middle, trying to parse that SQS message and just trying to figure out what we needed to trigger downstream. So in this case, in the presentation I'd listened to that said, you know, you really should be using this for transformations, they had recommended AWS step functions. So I thought, why not? Let's give this a go and see how it could work for this current architecture. So for those of you who don't know, step functions are a serverless orchestration service that allows you to um, manage inputs, outputs, retries, and error handling within your serverless workflows. So they really provide you with a holistic view and management of the interconnection between all of your different um, serverless services. So it really is amazing whenever you're starting to work with complex um, workflows that have multiple different serverless services within them. Oh, serverless services, <laughs> I feel like I'm getting myself caught up. But they integrate with up to 220 different AWS services. They operate on a pay per use model and they're fully managed and scale automatically. So let's try to see how uh, we can move our current architecture into working with these um, step function state machines. So the step function state machines come with all of these different flow states out of the box. So the first one on the screen you'll see is the choice state. So that kind of works like your if else where you have these different branches where you can choose to go down one flow or go to the other. The next one we have is, oh, I just noticed I can look here <laughs> instead of up here. The next one we have is the parallel state, and that allows you to run workflows um, in different branches in parallel. We then also have our map state, which allows you to run parallel workflows for each item in a data set. We have our path state, which can act um, as a placeholder, or you can use that to transform your data. You have your wait state that allows you to introduce um, specific delays into your, your step functions and your state machines. And then at the end, we also have our pass and success states. So whenever I'm looking at these different flow controls, the way you can make different choices, you can go through different branches, it always makes me think of these, you know, <laughs> the amazing quizzes at the back of a magazine where you start at the top with your really important input, you answer a bunch of questions, you move through all your different choices, and you find out that really important piece of information, and that is what reality TV show that you should star in. <laughs> and when looking at this and all of the choices and decisions, it just made me think of that onboarding service. You know, we need to start with what documents we have from the user. We've got all of these questions to ask, you know, what job are they going to? What documents do we need to check? What documents have we got available? This is exactly what we needed to be doing. So let's try to draw one up similar to, to these that could work for our solution. So we'll start with our input. The input for the set functions will be JSON. We will start with just passing in a unique identifier um, to start off um, the different transactions. We're going to pass in the URL, so there'll either be a URL present or it will be null. The first thing that we're going to do is make use of that parallel processing state. So remember back to just the different flows that we have. This one allows us to run multiple different branches at the same time. 
And you know, that was such a bottleneck of our old architecture, just waiting for every document to evaluate before we would start the next. So within our parallel processing state, we can start to make use of that choice state. So you can see each one of those branches now has their own little choice um, state flow added to it. So we start with, is the passport URL available? Yes or no. Do we have the CSCS URL? Yes or no. And do we have the national insurance image? Yes or no. And this now allows us to start to evaluate all of those checks at the exact same time. And we now have these branches where we can go in different directions. So in terms of a yes state, we're going to want to move on and invoke that lambda that is specific to that one document check. And kind of as I said, introducing step functions, you can integrate with 220 different AWS services. Lambda is one of them. So when you're building out your definitions, you're able to integrate um, directly by just invoking those lambdas in there. In the case where we don't actually have the image present, we're going to make use of that past state. So kind of whenever you look at the, the yellow kind of dash border around there of the parallel state, Everything will start to be invoked at the same time, but it won't actually move out of that parallel processing box until everything is completed. And in the case where we don't have an image, using that past state just kind of acts as a placeholder and says, okay, we don't have anything, we'll just mark this as past and we'll wait till everything else is completed and then we'll move on. So each of these lambdas are set up to return a results object. So this is gonna return, is that document valid, true or false? It will return any validation errors. So these could be things like the document had high glare on it. We weren't able to read their details. It could be we couldn't read the expiry date or maybe that document is expired. And then we would also return the first name and last name and if it was present on the document. Something that I haven't really mentioned is as you move from one flow to another, you can actually transform your data in transition. Uh, so each one of these lambdas are set up to return this results object, but we can actually select any different values that we want to move on to the next um, process in the state machine. What I wanted to do here was add them all into an array. This just gave me a bit more flexibility as at the end of this kind of parallel processing, we might have two results objects in that array, we might have all three, or we might only have one. And we're gonna pass however many elements have come out of that parallel processing array into this compare results lambda. And it was just purely set up then to just loop through however many results it got given access to. It would check, has everything come back with a valid? If it has, let's start comparing those names and making sure that they're consistent. If it hasn't, let's go in and look at those auto validation errors. Let's join them all together and present them to the user of why these documents have failed. So I have a demo here, let's hope it works. It is pre-recorded, <laughs> I didn't want to risk it, a live one. Um, let me see, I... So here you can see in the AWS console, we've got our state machine, anything in blue is still processing, the green is what is being evaluated. You can see we don't have the national insurance document, we have checked CSCS. Passport is still pending, so we haven't moved on from our parallel processing box until that will actually fully complete, and then we can move on. We can click on any of the state boxes at any time and view the output. Again, no real PII. These are fake documents, so you will see they do fail. And once we have all of the documents that have run, we pass them into that compare results, and we can start um, to see the reasons why they've failed overall. The visualization is quite nice as you can very quickly at a glance see what documents ran for a particular user. If there was um, an error maybe thrown in there that I wasn't catching, they would light up as red. So a really nice visual way for debugging and, and seeing your state transitions as well. So I wanted to touch a little bit on developer tools when you're actually building out these orchestrations and how you can um, work with them. So I'd mentioned your ability to transform data between the different steps. Um, and a really cool tool for doing that is this data flow simulator on the AWS console. It allows you to go in, paste in different objects, inputs, outputs, result paths, parameters, and it allows you just kind of play around with, can I extract maybe two keys from that object and pass it on? Can I transform this? Can I get that nested value out? And it's just a really good tool for, for playing around with your data set to try and figure out um, how you manage that data as it moves between steps. So 
If you are new to them, if you're looking to try them out, I would definitely recommend this tool. It just makes it a little bit easier to, to understand how your data moves and flows throughout the machine. I also really recommend the VS Code plugin for AWS in VS Code. So we write all of our um, step function definitions in SAM, which is the serverless application model as our infrastructure is code. It allows you to write the definitions as ASL, which is Amazon state language just in a JSON file. And whenever you're actually writing the JSON, you can see the visualization of your state machine appear in your editor. This is really great, especially if you're adding a new branch on, that you can see that visually appear. You know, if you start to see that appear right up at the top or the bottom, you know you've maybe added that into the wrong um, block of code. It's also really great if you're not seeing your diagram lo load, you know that maybe you've got a configuration issue in there and it just allows you to debug it that little bit more visually. You can create these through the AWS console, just through the drag and drop of the services. I would recommend going the infrastructure as code route. It just means that you can check these definitions into source control. You can have PR reviews and you can just kind of see that version history of your step function, state machine definitions changing. It also means you have that one definition file you can take from local into QA, into staging and into production. So let's talk about some of the benefits we have seen from moving from our first architecture into using step functions. And the first one is it's really reduced application complexity. You know, with our first architecture, the extendability of it was not great. With this one, if we needed to add in driving license and visa now, we can update this without actually touching application logic. We don't need to touch the individual passport lambda. We don't need to update the CSCS lambda. We can just create our own isolated service for check and driving license. And we don't even need to touch that compare results at the end. It is just set to loop through however many results objects it gets. All we have to update is just that definition and orchestration file around what is being triggered. Another huge benefit is the reduced time it takes to run. With that old ser service, that bottleneck was really starting to form. The more documents we were adding in, the time to run it was going to grow exponentially. So being able to take advantage of parallel processing has been an absolute game changer for us. And lastly, the ability to debug. Whenever we kick this off for a worker, we pass in their worker ID, the timestamp, and it just means if anything goes wrong, we can go straight into the console and that video that I showed you, you're able to click in and just very visually see what documents ran for this worker. Let's click into their different documents. Let's see their responses. And it just makes it a lot more visual instead of going through maybe hours worth of logs to try and figure out what happened and what went wrong. You're able to just kind of click in and see the exact outputs for exactly what ran for them. So being able to update our architecture into this kind of format, it's really extracted it so much from the core construction recruitment platform. It's completely operating independently now, and this has allowed the customer to realize that this document validation service actually has merit on its own, um, even to people outside of the construction industry who want to check identity documents and who maybe need to do that continuity check. So we have now partnered with the customer to bring this to the AWS marketplace, where we're going to launch it as a SaaS offering. So it's just really cool to see updating an architecture to decouple something that much has now created an additional business opportunity for us. So to launch it on the marketplace, we do need to change a few things slightly. And um, you can see we have another service integration now at the top where we reach out to DynamoDB. This allows us to grab a customer's endpoint. We can pass that the whole way through the, the kind of branching and the trees. And at the end, we just reach out to them like a webhook integration with their document results. And hopefully they have something in place to consume that and store it and kind of use it how they want. You can see we do have driving license added now. Visa will be there soon, still on the backlog. Um, but it's just crazy to see we've went from supporting three documents to five in a couple of months. This time next year, that could be 10 documents, that could be 20 documents. So it really does go to show that whenever you're building things, businesses and customers are always going to be changing. And really our success does lie in our ability to be adaptive and be able to ensure that our architectures can be extended um, for success. Being able to update this architecture has not just helped our development experience, but you know, adding that new business opportunity is such an added bonus. 
So I did want to cover a few recommended resources if you are interested in getting started with step functions. At reInvent um, this year, Ben Smith gave an absolutely amazing talk on the architectural patterns with step functions. QR code on the screen links to the recording of his whole session. He covered kind of reusable patterns, <coughs> best practices, cost optimizations. Really great talk. I, I've definitely learned a lot from. There is also serverless land. Again, the link on the screen or the QR code on the screen will link you out. It is like a one-stop shop for all things step functions. They have got blogs, they've got tutorials, use cases, templates, everything to really just get you started. And lastly, um, there was quite a few step functions announcements released at reInvent in November. I spent some time going through, testing them out, seeing how I could integrate them, seeing the benefits of them, and I put my findings all in a blog. So if you are kind of interested in this step two of step functions, um, feel free to, to scan the QR code and check it out as well. So that really is all for me. I have my X account, my LinkedIn, and my personal blog website on the screen. So feel free to connect with me on anything. I'm happy to take questions here, or I will be around today if you want to just chat one-on-one. -on -one. I love step functions, so <laughs> happy to answer any questions on them. Thank you. Questions? Oh, Kira, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Chloe. Um, I was just wondering about like the security aspect for like personal data. Is there any... I guess, pushback from customers, you know, on particular regions you use and things like that? Yeah, so anytime we have a, a customer for it, it is finding out what regions we can store their data on. At the minute, um, we're fully just um, London-based, so our data is stored in the UK. And then for things like the documents themselves, we're storing them in encrypted buckets. And we do have deletion policies defined with the customer of when we want to store them to when they need to be deleted. And then also anytime we're sending them, it's through pre-signed URLs that have a very tight expiry on them as well, just to make sure they're not getting out there. But yeah, that's always a scary thing with PII. And I do promise they were all dummy data. <laughs> Thank you. Any others? Ah, it's okay. It's not too far. I can do that. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. It's fine. Thank you. Hi, Chloe. Really great talk. I just want to ask a question around cost efficiency. You've eliminated that initial lambda function, but naturally there's charge two for the step function for each use. Uh, did you notice any uh, change in cost efficiency? haven't noticed any major cost. So there is with step functions, there are express ones and there are standard. Express um, do operate a little bit cheaper, but there is a very strict time limit on how long you have to run them. We are using standard, um, so we haven't seen a massive increase. I think you're charged per how many thousand transactions you run through your state machine. It is quite a low cost, and just being able to take out that bottleneck of the really long standing compute we had from the document validation service, it has kind of balanced itself out where we're not seeing a massive increase. But if you are working with any of these kind of services, I definitely recommend checking out the AWS cost calculator. You can kind of put in what your expected usage is, um, what type of flows you expect to be using, what services you're integrating with, and it can kind of just give you that better breakdown as well. Because I guess you're still paying for the individual Lambda compute, the database lookups, and it's just that added kind of orchestration around it. So anything at all, I would recommend using that cost calculator. And you know with the cloud, always make sure your billing <laughs> alerts are turned on. I think for probably a few people in here has been burdened by that before. So um, yeah, uh, that's, I think, all I've got. <laughs> it's much more responsible. I'm just like, it's not my money. Um, <laughs> anyone else? All right, thank you so much, Chloe. Thank you.